Keith was on tour in Europe. And so I kept hearing everybody talk about this Keith, but I hadn't met him. And then one night at theater sports, this older guy shows up wearing a, a long parka and carrying a paper bag with scripts and a box of Kleenex. I was like, who's that? But everybody was saying hi to him like he belonged there, so... And it was loose moose. People were coming in and out all the time. And then after the show, uh, we were in the green room, and I was standing in the door. Because like I said, I was, you know, quite young and shy. And Keith comes, stands next to me, and he goes, you see the couch? I said, yes. He said, now the man on the left, when I sit down, is probably going to cross his right leg over his left and turn away. He might get up and leave. And the woman on the right is going to do the opposite. She's going to turn towards me. She'll probably play with her hair. I'm like, who the hell is this? And he walked over and he sat down, and that was exactly what happened. And as I was staring at this magician, someone goes, hey, Keith. I'm like, ah, okay. Okay. I have a lot to learn. Keith looks through the world, or at the world, through a completely different lens. And his awareness of storytelling and how to move a scene forward. So when you look at the work that he does in improvisation, and it's about making something happen, he applies that when he's writing. So every scene stands on its own and adds to the larger piece. He knows and aims for storytelling to affect the audience. So when he's writing, he's already writing with that in mind. Working with him lifts it even further. And he will use devices to bring the audience in. He doesn't want theater to be static or like a museum. He wants to really captivate everybody in the room. So when we did Mutiny on the Bounty and the bounty hits the great storm, we gave the front row of the audience water pistols. So while Captain Bly is doing a monologue, the front row of the audience is just basically at an amusement park, shooting him. Um, would they come by night? As vampires, we were crawling around the audience when we, you know, getting them involved in the production. Um, he creates an event. He tells the story. And he unleashes the actor fully to be able to tell that story. Keith's theories and philosophies started with him recognizing his place in the world and observing theater, watching how actors looked wooden on stage and trying to assess and figure out why and to find solutions to that. When we were creating work at Loose Moose, Keith would come in and his plays had his impro theories written in. You could see it. Each rehearsal process was using all of his classic games and exercises. It was using the listening, the awareness, the connection. He was always finding ways to give us permission as actors to step into the story. For example, in Mutiny, because um, I was maybe about 19, I think, 20, something like that when we did that. And there was a scene that I was in where I was teaching Fletcher Christian Tahitian, and he was teaching me English. Um, and Keith did a great flip on that. At the start of the second act, as the lights are coming up, you hear these British accents saying, my goodness, look at them. Look at how they're dressed. Unbelievable. And as the lights come up, that's the Tahitians talking about the British, which was wonderful. Anyway, I'm doing this scene, and in the script, it said I would take Fletcher's hand and put it on my breast and say breast. 
And that made me nervous. You know, I was pretty naive and shy. I was like, oh, okay, all right, I'm an actor. That's what actors do. I'll prepare for this rehearsal. So go into rehearsal the night we're doing that scene. And before we start, Keith says, can I talk to you? I said, yeah. He said, so we're doing this scene tonight with the language. And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, look, I think Michael would be very embarrassed if you put his hand on your breast. So to make it easier for him, when you take his hand, put your thumb on his palm. So when you place the hand, there's no contact. I think it would just be easier. I went, oh, yes, oh, yeah, oh, of course, you know, for Michael, of course, I'll do that. It took me years to realize he did that for me. He knew I was the one at risk. He knew I was the one that would be uncomfortable. He knew I was shy. He didn't tell me that in front of the group of people to make me feel lesser. He gave me a tool away from the group and he framed it in a way that it felt like I was doing something for someone else. He recognized my fear and he took it away. He did that continually every time we worked. And when you hear how actors are struggling when they go into work and they have a script and the bullshit that's happening in the rehearsal room with the dominance of some directors where they think that actors mean nothing. Keith came into the room going, how do I open you up? How do I help you step forward? And those are the techniques he's put into his improvisation games and work. I think Keith's work has been used a lot for actors and writers in, in opening up their work. If, if you look at how many people worked at Loose Moose who are now writing series and shows, right? Um, and they apply it differently. So for some people, they've gravitated towards the pure technical, right? Platform, circle of possibilities, whose scene is it? How do you affect someone? Reincorporation. You know, um, and you'll see that applied in the work. So, for example, uh, Deborah Francis White has written a movie called Say My Name. And you can see in the opening sequence, she's applying what she's learned from Keith. She sets a platform of the characters, and then she just keeps getting them in more and more and more trouble. And every bit of trouble changes and affects them, changes and affects them. And the rest of the movie is them getting in more trouble and reincorporation. And it's a beautiful ride. Um, you can see it in Venus Sood's acting on camera. You can see that she's really trying to connect. And when she's saying her lines, she's trying to influence and change the other character she's in the scene with. Definitely with Norm. Um, and actually, I've chatted with Norm about it. When we had a reunion um, a couple of years back, Norm Skyped in and was talking about Keith and the impact of Keith's work in his writing and his awareness that he's using the technique in his work. If you've been trained in that and it makes sense to you, the work is going to naturally apply. It's going to naturally um, transition over. And it does produce a different form of theater. It's a different form of storytelling. The aim is clearly on what we're creating, how we're creating it, and how we're going to bring the audience, whatever audience that is, how we're going to bring them into that work. And everybody's on the team to do that. It binds individuals into a collective. He was teaching a class, and there was a student in the class who was really nervous. It was at one of the international schools. And they were nervous because they're performing in front of Keith. And I actually saw this transition from when he was working with us as moosers to when international groups would come in. There was a whole different dynamic that happened in the room. And Keith's ability to spot it and deal with it was amazing. So there's this student 
really nervous. And everything he would say on stage, he would look at Keith for approval. So he'd be talking to someone and he'd go, um, yes, I'd like a cup of coffee. Yes, that would be lovely. Yes, I'd like to sit down. And it completely, the, the scene was a shambles. But Keith recognized that this person's fear was not pleasing Keith. So they kept looking at Keith to get his approval because that was the thing they feared. So, removing the fear, interrupting the intellect, Keith says, ah, I'd like you to play the scene again. Whenever you make eye contact with me, I want you to say, fuck off, Keith. And the guy was, what? Ah, yes. Do you have that? Fuck off, Keith. Whenever you see me, say this. And because the guy wants to please Keith, he wants to do the game. But what he has to do in the game is the thing that he, you know, didn't want to have happen in life. So the scene starts. Would you like coffee? Yes, I'd. Keith goes, go on. Fuck off, Keith. Yes, excellent, that's wonderful. Yes, I'd like to sit down. Fuck off, Keith. Yes, I'd like... And then eventually he stopped looking at Keith and played the scene. Keith doesn't tell you what you need to do. Keith finds a solution to help you discover what you need to do in the moment. And this is part of his brilliance. He doesn't watch a scene and then afterwards say, do that scene again and don't look at me, which would actually reinforce this guy's anxiety. He found a playful game in the moment that he could do that broke and changed the pattern so that improviser becomes a different improviser after that two minutes. I think Keith's work globally has had a huge impact and will leave a huge imprint. Even the basis of being able to listen, be present, accept, remove fear, remove ego, starts forming a different level of conversation and if people could anchor in that, I think the conversations that are happening in the world now would change. The conversations now are about fear and ego, and this is the opposite. It's also tools in understanding how we relate and respond as humans. And we're not really giving each other a lot of space to be who we are. There's a lot about Keith's work that I think just makes us better people. I know when I'm in a room full of improvisers that have trained with Keith, it's the safest, most joyous place to be. On stage or off, it's just a different level of connection and communication. How has Keith's work affected me? Um, it's given me a career. <laughs> um, it's helped me to be braver, bolder. It's helped me to take risks in areas I probably wouldn't help me to laugh at my mistakes, but learn from my mistakes. Um, I know when my ego is flaring up and I can give it a little cuddle and put it away. It's helped me to pay attention to my listening, my communication skills, and also because I've been taught in directing improvisation to pull back and look at what's happening in a communication with a director's eye and go, ah, what are all these characters in this play fighting over? How can I move this scene forward? I can almost tell when I'm in a room with improvisers that have connection with Keith's work in contrast to other schools. There's a different energy that they bring in backstage. Um, improvisers that have Keith training come in and they're quite calm and relaxed. Um, in other schools of thought, there seems to be this anxiety around. And I think that comes from understanding fear, embracing fear, removing fear, instead of allowing fear to be a motivator. There's a different ethic in the wings or on the side of the stage. Usually, Keith improvisers will 
be watching to the sides to see how their partners are doing. If someone's making a move to go on, you let them go on. You don't put your elbow up and step out first. Even though improvisation professes acceptance, support, I'm amazed how many improvisers are unaware and unsupportive and actually competitive and in like battle mode on the side. So I can tell when I'm playing with other people that have Keith training or they'll do things like they provide space, they create space. Yeah, they'll set up a scene and turn and offer it to other improvisers instead of creating the space for them to do the thing that they do really, really well. There's different, there's a different mental state that's happening. The other thing that's usually a real sign is after the show, who wants to talk about the show from an honest level and a growth level to actually sit down and go, what hit, what missed, what could we have done, how was the audience, and people who just want to be told they're good. And look, we all want to be told we're good. We all want the pats on the back, absolutely. But for me, post-show notes and reflection and a chance to have an authentic communication with artists I respect and trust is essential to my growth as a performer and an artist. And it's really difficult at festivals to have that because a lot of companies and a lot of schools of thought believe that once it's done, you don't have that reflection. You don't learn from it. You don't grow from it. Which is why I think some forms of improvisation are spinning, chasing its tail, doing the same work it did 20 years ago. So, um, Meet the Duck and Penguin. Keith started exploring um, this exercise where he would put a toy on stage like this and you'd have to improvise with it. An object that is not reacting or responding at all often would look like the best actor on stage. Are you ready for your interview? You look great on camera. I don't know if he's going to ask that. Well, if he does, you'll have to answer. What do you mean you walk off set? And what the audience does is the audience starts endowing this object with attitude, with emotion, with responses. So it was a great example to show how much we do and how much or what really we don't have to do because of the audience's interpretation of what we're doing. The audience helps create the story. The audience reads in. The audience endows reaction and response. And so he started going around the world with toys. And he'd go into an airport and he'd buy a new toy. So when he came to Melbourne, we were doing the duck game. He goes somewhere else and he does the penguin game. Someone else has the sheep Someone else has the camel. But you'd go somewhere and say, do you know the duck game? Well, I don't know the duck game. Oh, you do this. Oh, you mean the camel game? The camel game? And I'm sure he deliberately did that to mess with people. But there was a moment where I was with Keith and we were in a toy store. And he started auditioning <laughs> toys. So he'd pull a toy out and he'd sit it down. And he'd go, hmm. Yes, yes, you've made the first cut. Oh, yes, yes, okay. Yeah, quite talented. Right, could you tell me your first name? Mm. Mm, good, good. And he would audition toys. I was having a great time. But I was also watching all these people with their kids walking by. Adults looking horrified. There's, there's this man talking to toys. And all these children going... Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I know exactly what you're doing. And, you know, kids wanting to play. And adults dragging the kids aside.
I'd really like Keith to be remembered for the work he's created. And I think Keith, with a lot of his philosophies, were really anti-establishment. He really broke the rules of any environment that he was in. So the establishment fears him and they don't give him the credibility. And I understand that. If you've got someone who's teaching at a university and they're not following the policy, you're not going to put their name and face up on the wall next to other people that you deem to be art. Keith has never cared about the name and face and plaque on the wall. He's cared about creating something of value for the actor and the audience. And he's never sought to be a guru. He has sought to create the work. Therefore, he's never chased the interviews. He's never chased doing, you know, um, anything that's going to self-grandize him. That's a waste of his time and energy when he can be writing a play or working with actors or actually being in the room creating the work. Because of this, I think we, have a, we don't have as much resource material on Keith. And that makes it problematic when you talk to students who have a lot of resource material on other forms of improvisation. Often, that resource material is students two and three and four generations past the original teacher. But there's a lot of ego and status in that. And a lot of students that work with Keith are too busy doing the work to worry about trying to be gurus themselves. Because our example was a teacher who cared about the work, who cared about the student, who cared about the audience, who didn't care about himself and his own guru reputation. That wasn't the goal. And that's been passed on to the students as well. We're too busy creating the work, sharing the work, and doing the work. But he should get the recognition he deserves. His name should be known for what he's created. That's only fair and just, respectful, and right. <laughs>